Part One, Story One of Tales from Wagner by J. Walker McSpadden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One, The Ring of the Curse. Story One, The Rheingold. Das Rheingold. Hundreds of years ago, in a wonderful time called the Dawn of the World, there lived many strange beings which do not now exist. Gods and goddesses dwelt in the clouds that hovered above the mountain peaks great untamed giants roamed amid the valleys swarthy misshapen dwarfs called nibelungs toiled in the caves of the underworld heaping up treasures of gold and silver which never did any one any good ugly dragons crawled upon the earth while beautiful water nymphs lived in the rivers and seas lastly there were heroes and savage men who struggled together for the mastery in that far-off day when the world was in the making how the end came to all these strange things and how the reign of the gods finally ceased will be set down in this fourfold story i am about to tell you in the clear depths of the river rhine in germany once dwelt three water nymphs lovely maidens who were very like other maidens except that they passed their whole lives under the water and could not be seen by ordinary eyes fair were they in face and graceful in form their eyes beamed gladness, for they had never known sorrow, while their long golden hair floated about them like a garment, or tossed upon the wave-crest as they played some merry game of hide-and-seek amid the grottoes of their watery world. They were called the Rhine Daughters, and thus in frolicsome play did they spend their days, free from all care save one. It was this care and the sorrow following close upon it that caused the present story to be told upon one of the highest rocks deep down in the bed of the rhine was stored a great lump of pure gold brighter and more dazzling than any other treasure ever known it was also more wonderful than any other gold because it contained the power of making its owner master of all the world this treasure had lain undisturbed in the river's bed for so long that it had come to be known as the rhine gold it was watched over by the Rhine daughters in whose care their father had left it. This was their sole duty, to keep guard night and day, lest some thief should come and steal the priceless treasure. One bright morning the maidens seemed unusually merry. They darted in and out the caverns with a speed which left the flying fish far behind. They laughed and chattered and sang but glancing from time to time up at the precious rhine-gold to see if it still glittered upon its protecting crag presently their happy noise at play attracted a passer-by who clambered upon one of the jutting rocks to see what it was all about the newcomer stood in the greatest contrast to the three laughing girls he was a dwarf little and ugly and crooked with a humped back and long claw-like fingers to match the eager grasping look in his small eyes he was albrich of the race of the nibelungs the earth dwarfs who dug for treasure in the underground caverns and hammered and toiled without ceasing for the gold that never did them any good ho ho he exclaimed to the maidens a fair morning to you the nymphs started in alarm at the harsh croaking voice nor did their first sight of the visitor reassure them but they replied civilly enough a fair morning to you sir then one of them darted swiftly upward singing as she went guard well the gold twas just such a foe our father foretold nevertheless albrick had paid no attention to the gold so pleased was he by the nymphs and their gambols and they in turn losing their fear of the uncouth monster and willing to tease him asked him to catch them in their game of hide-and-seek this he tried to do but blinded by the unusual light and stumbling awkwardly over the rocks he could never keep up with their fairy-like antics first one and then another would come near him or ascend the rocks but it was always just beyond his reach finally their laughter and teasing made him angry and he stopped short refusing to be made sport of any longer just then a ray of sunlight filtered down through the water and struck the rheingold instantly it glowed as though it were a mass of flame reflecting a hundred shafts of light where one had smitten it the whole river-bed was illuminated by the glorious rays 
The astonished dwarf looked toward the source of this splendor, and what he saw made his small eyes fairly bulge out with greed. Yet he concealed his amazement and waited to learn something about this splendid treasure without betraying his own interest. Fortune favored him. His unspoken question was answered by the Rhine maidens, who surged upward with a glad cry of, The Rhine gold! The Rhine gold! What is this Rhine gold you are talking about? asked the dwarf with a great show of indifference. What? Haven't you ever heard of the wonderful Rhine gold? asked one of the maidens thoughtlessly. We supposed it was famed over all the world. But I dwell in the underworld, and hear not the things which are spoken among men. Tell me of it, I pray. Then the maiden forgot her father's warning to guard the treasure closely. She also felt nothing but contempt for this awkward little man from whom they could so easily escape. She told the secret of the gold in the words of a song. The realm of the world to him shall it bring, who out of this gold shall fashion a ring of magical power untold. Hmm, say you so, said the dwarf, keeping his excitement down by a powerful effort, though his fingernails fairly clawed into the flesh. If your metal is as fine as all that, why doesn't someone lay hands upon it and do all these great things? Sister, sister, be careful, said another of the nymphs. But the first only laughed and replied, What can this silly old fellow do? Let us have some more fun teasing him. Then the third maiden floated gracefully near. Why doesn't someone seize the gold? she repeated. Tis because no one has yet been able to pay the price. What is the price? This is it, she answered. Listen. He who forswears the might of love, and all its pleasures manifold, he only has the magic art to mould the ring from out the gold. Pish! A pretty story you are telling me, said the dwarf, as though a little matter like doing without love should make a person master of the world. He made a great show of scorn while he said these words, but all the time he was edging quietly nearer the treasure. But love is the greatest thing in the world, said the first maiden. No one can do anything without his wonderful aid. Why, even you, poor old fellow, would dare not forswear it. I would not dare forswear it, eh? exclaimed the dwarf with a snap of his fingers and a wild laugh of triumph. Love, forsooth, what is love to me when gold is in question? Hark, you Rhine maidens, I renounce love forever. Be my witness and he sprang rapidly forward before the nymphs could prevent him, clambered up the jagged rock, and seized the coveted treasure. "'Our Rhinegold! Our Rhinegold!' shrieked the maidens, but it was too late. Already he had disappeared in one of the clefts of rock leading to his cavernous home, and though they darted after him, they could not find him in the dark depths. Only his mocking laugh came back to them. "'Ho, ho, love, when all the world shall be mine!' Now we have already seen that the nymphs and the dwarfs formed only a part of the strange world so long ago. At the very time when Albrecht was stealing the gold and preparing to make the ring of power down under the earth, there was an unusual happening in the home of the gods far up on the mountains. For a long time Wotan, the greatest of the gods, had desired a palace large enough to contain his kingly court but he could find no one strong enough to build it, until, on a day, two giants from the valleys below came into his presence. Large were they of shoulder and thigh, many times larger than ordinary men. "'We have come to build your palace,' they said. "'Who are ye?' asked Wotan, looking piercingly at them with his single eye. "'I am Fafner, the frost giant,' answered one. I can rend all these rocks asunder and build your palace in a single night with the aid of my brother Fasolt here. Wotan was overjoyed to find someone who would undertake his cherished plan. What payment do you desire for this service? he asked. You must give me the hand of your beautiful sister Freya, answered Fafner. Wotan frowned. He desired the palace above all things just then, for it would enforce his visible rule over the world. But Freya was his favorite sister. Moreover, it was she who was the goddess of youth and beauty, and who tended the tree of golden apples which kept the gods always young. 
While Wotan was frowning and pondering to himself, his brother Loki whispered in his ear, "'Let them build the palace. We shall find another way out of the bargain.' Now Loki, god of fire, was the craftiest of all the gods. So when Wotan heard his whispered advice, his brow cleared, and he looked at the giants. "'So be it,' he commanded. "'Build me the castle against another sunrise. It shall be Valhalla, the supreme home of gods and men.' The giants bowed and went their way. Presently the sound of mighty blows was heard, and terrific crashes as of the bursting asunder of rocks. All the day and night the tumult continued, while the earth shook to its very foundations. The next morning the rising sun lit up a splendid spectacle. There stood Valhalla, magnificent home of the gods, upon the crest of a towering cliff. Its white walls gleamed and glistened, its towers and buttresses were built of stones so large that they seemed placed for all eternity, yet the whole mass appeared as light and graceful as a fairy vision. "'Beautiful! Wonderful!' cried the gods and goddesses in rapture. "'Let us take up our abode in our new home,' said Wotan, with the delight of a schoolboy. But just then the two giants appeared clad in their shaggy skins of slain animals. Hold, said Fafner, first give us in payment the goddess Freya, as you promised us. That I cannot do, replied Wotan. You must think of some other way for me to reward you. Not so, exclaimed the giants angrily, their hoarse voices making all the mountain quiver. Give us the maiden as you agreed, else we shall tear down the palace quicker than we built it. And they placed themselves on each side of the trembling Freya. "'Touch her not!' cried two gods, as they sprang forth to protect their sister. "'Do you not know,' continued one, "'that I am Thor, god of thunder, and that with one blow of my hammer I can crush you both?' And he raised his hammer threateningly, but now the great Wotan interposed in his turn. "'Restrain your fury,' he commanded, stretching forth the dread spear of authority between the giants and the gods. By this spear the word of Wotan cannot be broken, and unless Fasolt and Fafner agree to accept other reward, they must e'en take our sister with them to the regions of Frost. At this command the contending ones fell back, but there arose a low cry of fear from the lovely Freya, and a deep lamentation from the other gods. For how could they live without their sweet sister, she who gave them the apples of eternal youth? Meanwhile, Wotan had been casting his eyes impatiently from side to side. He was looking for his crafty counsellor, Loki, and wondering why he did not appear with his aid, since he it was who had promised to find a way out of the bargain. "'Come, decide,' said the giants, again stepping forward. "'Only one hour more,' pleaded Wotan. "'I must confer with my counsellor, who is just now absent.' "'Only one hour, then,' replied the giants." "'Send out messengers in search of Loki, god of fire,' commanded Wotan. "'Let him be summoned instantly.' But at this moment who should appear but Loki himself, walking in unconcernedly, and looking about in feigned surprise, as though he were the last person any one would wish to see. "'Good morrow all,' he said airily. "'This is a beautiful castle I see upon yon mountain height. I have just been examining it from every side.' and upon my word it would defy even my arts to destroy it. Yes, yes, replied Wotan impatiently, beginning to be a little ashamed of his fine Valhalla. But that is not the point just now. These giants demand our sister Freya as their reward, and you remember you promised to find a substitute for her. The sly Loki arched his eyebrows in mock surprise. A substitute for her? he exclaimed. Why, how could that be possible? I should think that Fasolt and Fafner would rather have her than all the treasures in the world. Is she not the goddess of youth and beauty? At this the two gods, Thor and Fro, raised their weapons in great anger, and would have fallen upon Loki had not Wotan restrained them. He knew the cunning of the latter, and was persuaded that Loki had found a plan. Yes, proceeded Loki, as calmly as though there had been no interruption, all the riches in the world would not take the place of Freya. Even the far-famed Rhinegold would hardly answer, 
and speaking of the rhine gold do you know that i have just heard a strange story while passing along the banks of the rhine i became aware of the sound of pitiful weeping and wailing i turned me about to see whence the doleful sound came and i beheld the three rhine daughters they were no longer joyous and carefree as was their wont, but they were beating their breasts and tearing their hair while they cried, Our Rheingold, our Rheingold, stolen, stolen! What? Have they suffered the Rheingold to be stolen? asked Wotan in alarm. Tis as they said, for I stopped and questioned them. They said that the dwarf Albrecht had seized upon the treasure and fled away to his earth caverns, where he was even now making the magic ring of power. He has set himself up as king of the Nibelungs, and he purposes to rule the whole world. The giants Fafner and Fasolt leaned eagerly forward and drank in every word of Loki's story, as indeed he had intended they should ah that would be a prize worth having they exclaimed rubbing their huge hands mighty wotan if thou wilt wrest this treasure from the nibelung and give it to us we will release the goddess but wotan again grew disturbed and silent he knew that the gold rightfully belonged to the rhine daughters and that it would prove a danger even to the gods themselves unless it were returned the giants saw their advantage and followed it up decide for yourselves they said laying bold hands upon freya our work is done and we claim the reward either this maiden or the rhinegold and until you decide she must follow us to the frost land and unmindful of her cries of distress the giants bore freya away across the cliffs and down the mountainside the gods standing powerless to prevent as they stood gazing in dismay a thin mist arose from the valleys and it seemed to touch all the gods with blight as it were a frost for the goddess of youth and beauty was gone and old age had already begun to lay hand upon those that remained come this will never do exclaimed loki in jeering tones will you stand in your tracks and let old age blight you and then he began to taunt each of the gods separately as was his wont look cried fricka wife of wotan the golden apples even now are withering wotan husband behold thy doom see how thy compact hath wrought ruin and wreck for us all wotan started up fired by a sudden resolution up loki he commanded follow me we must fare to the caverns of night and seize upon this gold and then asked loki the rhine daughters implored thine aid wilt thou restore it to them tis idle talk retorted wotan moodily freya the goddess of youth and beauty must be ransomed else we shall all perish then let us hence said loki who had gained the point at which he had aimed from the outset let us hence i know a cleft in the rock which serves as a chimney for the nibelung's forge fires perchance he is even now hammering out the ring of power come let us descend into his cavernous dwelling so saying the god of fire wrapped his mantle about him and set forth closely followed by wotan with his dread spear of authority as two simple wayfarers they travelled down the rocky chasm down 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 and still down while the hammering from the forges grew louder and the sulphurous smoke came curling up more and more thickly till it would have suffocated any one but a god at last they emerged into a huge cave around which hurried hundreds of queer little people each as ugly and crooked and dirty as albrecht they were blowing the fires pounding away with huge masses of metal or scurrying about with armloads of gold silver and precious stones just then the two wayfarers heard a quarrelling in a side passage of the cave when in came albrecht himself dragging another dwarf shrieking by the ear it was mime his own brother but that made no difference with albrecht where's the helmet you rogue he said it shall not be well with your skin if you don't give it up mercy mercy howled mime the tears making little furrows down his dirty face i haven't got it done yet yes you have what is that that you are trying to hide in your hands give it to me i say and albrecht seized the object which mime had just dropped in terror 
ah just as i thought continued the stronger brother here is the magic helmet all complete and this sly knave thought to keep it for himself but i shall pay him for his treachery hark you rascals he continued turning to all the dwarfs i am your king you must henceforth serve me alone and pile up all your treasure in the royal vaults i have this day obtained the powers of magic which make you my servants at this moment you see me not but i shall make myself felt among you i promise you and with this speech he clapped the helmet upon his head and instantly vanished but in his stead there came a pillar of mist and out of the mist came his voice sternly commanding them to obey then the sharp lashes of a whip were heard right and left and mime fell groaning to the ground while the others retreated in terror seemingly driven along a narrow way on the far side of the cavern albrecht was beginning his reign with a vengeance meanwhile the two celestial visitors had stood unnoticed in a side passage while they debated as to the best means of making their presence known, Albrecht came back in his true shape, carrying the helmet in his hand, fondling the ring upon his finger, and chuckling with glee. Then he espied the two gods, and his brow wrinkled darkly. "'Why come you to my caverns?' he demanded. "'Know you not that I am king here, and that strangers are not welcome?' "'We have but come to see some of the marvels of which we have heard so much.' said wotan pacifically hm said alberich you look quiet enough but i think i know you both yet i fear you not whether gods or men for i am master here and what if we are indeed gods dear alberich said loki taking off his mantle see i am the god of fire and your best friend do i not keep all your forges going yes that may be true retorted alberich but for all that i fear neither you nor wotan the mighty with this ring made from the rhinegold i can defy you all alberich's accustomed low cunning had vanished before his sudden access of power he was no match for the crafty god loki oh what a beautiful ring exclaimed the latter bending forward admiringly is it really made from the far-famed rhinegold it is said alberich swelling up i made it myself and its possession gives me everything in the world except love but some people think that love is the chief thing said loki pooh that's because they haven't the gold i have the two do not go together anyway and never will as for me give me gold and power and he kissed the ring but what if someone stole the ring while you slept persisted loki they couldn't retorted the dwarf quickly see this helmet that silly brother of mine yonder in the corner has just made it for me out of some more of this fine rhinegold with it i can change myself into any form i choose and defy the slyest of robbers oh that cannot be replied loki only the gods can do such things unless i saw such a marvel with my own eyes i never would believe it Albrecht looked with scorn upon this doubting fellow, then, willing to prove his boast, he put the helmet upon his head, and muttered a few words. Instantly he was gone, and in his stead a huge serpent came wriggling along the floor, stretching its hideous jaws toward Wotan and Loki. The latter fled in pretended terror, while Wotan laughed calmly. The snake then disappeared, and the dwarf once more stood before them now do you doubt my power he asked proudly oh it was wonderful exclaimed loki rolling his eyes i couldn't have believed it possible but i should think it would be a great deal harder to turn yourself into something small not at all replied the nibelung watch this and before the gods were aware he was gone again they looked high and low and there among the small stones a toad came hopping toward them quick put your foot on him exclaimed loki wotan put his boot upon the toad and instantly it was gone and in its place alberich lay struggling vainly to get out let me up you are crushing me screamed the dwarf not until you give us every bit of the rhinegold the helmet and the ring said wotan you can have all but the helmet and the ring and there's a lot of it beautiful gold whined alberich no all of it said wotan you can have the helmet too oh you're smashing me 
The ring and all, I tell you. Here, Loki, bind him with that rope. Then take the gold, the helmet and the ring, cried the dwarf despairingly. They bound him and let him up. As soon as he could catch his breath, he continued, Take the ring and all, but listen well to what I say. My curse rests upon it forever. Cursed be he who owns it, whether eating or sleeping or waking. Cursed be he and all his, whether God or devil. Sorrow and unhappiness shall go with this gold through all the ends of the earth. Notwithstanding this dread curse, the gods seized the ring from off his finger, and lost no time in making off with the treasure, leaving the dwarf groveling upon the floor, and muttering fierce words against them. All their care now was to ransom their sister, and drive away the mists of old age. On their way up the mountain height they met the two giants bearing away the struggling Freya in their clutches. "'Hold!' commanded Wotan. "'Bear her no farther. We have brought the gold to ransom her.' "'Is it the far-famed Rhine-gold?' asked Fafner. "'See for yourselves,' said Loki, casting the glittering heap upon the earth. "'In all the world ye will not find its like.' The giants gazed greedily upon the hoard and drew near to Parley. "'Tis indeed a wonderful treasure,' they said but the mass must equal in height and breadth the stature of this comely goddess. So be it, answered Wotan, and he commanded that staves be set upright in the ground, and that the gold be heaped between them. Thor and Fro and others of the gods had now arrived upon the scene, all overjoyed at the prospect of Freya's release, for already the blighting mist was beginning to lift, though it yet concealed the fair towers of Valhalla. Meanwhile, Loki had been careful to withhold the ring and the helmet from the rest of the hoard, which was now quickly heaped up between the upright staves. At last, just as the gold was exhausted, the pile rose above the top of Freya's head. "'Here, take the treasure,' said Wotan, "'and release our sister unto us.' "'Nay, not so,' said Fafner. I see a hole in the heap, and uh, through it gleams the goddess's hair, brighter than any gold. You must fill the hole. Cast on the helmet which yonder Loki is bearing. Wotan could scarce restrain his rage at this rude bartering of his sister, while the impetuous Thor fingered his mighty hammer nervously. But Wotan saw it was useless to refuse. He made a sign of command to the unwilling Loki, and the latter cast the helmet on the heap. Fafner again walked around it, looking closely on every side. Ah! he exclaimed, here is just one more little crack, but through it I can see the gleam of the goddess's lovely eyes. You must place the ring here to make the ransom complete. Never! cried Wotan furiously. Very well, then, we shall be forced to take the goddess with us and once more Fasolt laid his rude hands upon the shrinking maiden. Thereupon a great tumult began. The voices of the gods rose in entreaty to Wotan to give up the ring and save their sister and themselves. Thor sprang forward with uplifted hammer, while the hoarse voices of the giants bade defiance to them all. Again the dread mist crept up from the valleys, and darkness descended from the clouds. Still, Wotan remained defiant. He was turning away in anger from the tumult, when out of a cleft in the rock a weird bluish light broke forth, and there emerged a woman of dignified and noble mien. Her long black hair swept upon the ground, and her flowing robe seemed made of all the leaves and growing things of the soil. She was Erda, the spirit of Mother Earth, gifted with wisdom and foresight such as was not given even to the gods themselves erda stretched her hand out warningly toward wotan yield o wotan she cried escape the curse of the ring and all the hopeless woe it entails who art thou boding spirit demanded wotan and in a chanting voice came back the reply all that was i know all that is i know all that ever shall be done, this as well I know. Erda the name I bear, the fates my daughters are. Danger threatens dire, this has drawn me near. Hearken, 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 all that is shall end. Heed ye well, ere dawn of doom, beware the cursed ring. 
As the chant ended, the bluish light died away, and with it vanished the warning figure. "'Oh, stay, dread spirit!' cried Wotan. "'More would I learn!' But only silence answered him, and after gazing into the darkness in anxious thought, he turned suddenly and approached the giants. "'Here is the ring,' said he sternly, drawing it from his finger and placing it upon the heap. "'Be gone, and leave us our sister. But a curse has fallen upon the gold.' And so it proved. The gods themselves were witness of the first fruits of the curse, for as the two giants fell greedily to work gathering up the treasure, a dispute arose. Fasolt claimed that Fafner was taking more than his rightful share. They came to blows over it when Fafner smote Fasolt to the ground with a blow so heavy that it killed him. Then the victor, unmindful of his deed, hastily gathered up all the wealth and departed, while the gods stood around, silent and amazed, that the curse should descend so swiftly. And Wotan foresaw in this tragic moment the awful doom which was one day to descend upon them all, because the gold had not been restored to the Rhine daughters. But his gloomy thoughts were broken just then by a mighty crash, like a peal of thunder. There, upon the cliff leading to the beautiful new palace, which had cost so much, stood Thor, wielding his hammer upon the encircling clouds. Flashes of lightning burst forth. The clouds and mist rolled away, revealing Valhalla in all its splendor, while from their feet in dazzling radiance gleamed a rainbow bridge leading across the chasm to its portals. "'Come, let us go over to our new home,' said Wotan, taking his wife Fricka by the hand. And, followed by the laughing gods and goddesses who surrounded Freya, fairest of the group, they went across the rainbow bridge and entered the stately halls of Valhalla. The setting sun shone brightly on the scene. The clouds had melted away into blue sky, leaving a soft radiance which seemed to encircle their new home in a halo of delight. The evening fragrance of the valleys came up to them, redolent with the springtime of growing things. As they trod the shining pathway, the jests and merriment of the gods showed their gladness in this new home that had been made for them at so great a cost. Still, Wotan was not happy. He had decided seemingly for the best, but as he crossed the arching bridge, he heard voices from the valley far beneath him, rising like the tones of conscience or the warnings of fate. It was the mournful song of the Rhine daughters. Rhine gold, purest gold, how fair thy gleam, thy wealth untold, but now thy rays light not the stream, and give them back, give back the gleam, Rhine gold. End of story one. Part one, story two of Tales from Wagner by J. Walker McSpadden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part one, The Ring of the Curse, story two, The War Maidens, Die Valkyrie. The new home of the gods proved to be as beautiful within as it had appeared without. When they had all crossed the arching rainbow bridge, loud shouts of joy and admiration arose, for it was the most splendid palace that gods or mortals could ever imagine. Long porticos and galleries with huge sculptured pillars ran in every direction, leading to cool fruit arbors or open courts where silvery fountains splashed. Great rooms opened up with ceilings so high that they seemed to take in the sky itself. The spacious floors were paved with burnished gold, and the walls set with polished stone and fine jewels, so that they blazed with light as bright as the noonday. On every side of the palace were smooth green swords and groves of stately trees, and in the midst of the largest grove of all grew the wonderful tree bearing apples of gold, from which Freya fed all the divine family to make them immortal. For a long time the gods and goddesses lived in Valhalla quite happily. Each morning they found some new beauty to admire, each evening they came together for a feast or entertainment. But in one heart there was no happiness, and that was the heart of the mighty Wotan himself. His beautiful home, the dream of his life, was finished. But at what a cost! 
the curse of the rhinegold would come upon them unless the stolen treasure were returned to its rightful guardians the gods themselves would be destroyed if they kept not their honour so wotan sat apart from the rest and his brow grew dark with forebodings fricka his wife gently chided him for his gloom but to no avail and even the beautiful freya could no longer make him smile when any of the other gods praised the beauty of the palace he would nod his head and answer its price was great finally wotan could endure his anxiety no longer knowing that unless some way were found to restore the gold they would be in constant peril he resolved to consult erda the earth spirit so one day he took his spear of authority and went forth into the world to find a way out of the trouble which had come to him with valhalla the weeks grew into months and the months into years while wotan was gone the other gods sought him in vain but could hear no tidings they wondered what had become of him and the feasting and revelry gave way to sad forebodings only fricka the queen went about with some measure of confidence be not sad she said wotan will return soon bringing with him some great means of safety and content fricka spoke true one fair day at early dawn the gods were awakened by the sound of warlike singing it was entirely different from their own music and it seemed borne to them on the wings of the wind nearer and nearer came the song swelling into a splendid strain of triumph then flying figures were descried and the watchers at the window saw wotan returning to them as it were through the clouds he was in the midst of a company of maidens whose faces were fair but who were strong and soldier-like each rode upon a powerful horse and wonder of wonders the horses had wings like eagles and flew swiftly through the air there were nine of these horses and riders in all and so fast did they ride that they had reached the palace gates dismounted and were being led within by wotan almost before the first strains of music had died away you may believe that all the gods and goddesses were exceedingly glad when they saw wotan again and they hastened out upon the battlements to greet him and give him love and honour to one and all he replied full pleasantly his brow was clearer than it had been in many a day and it was with the sprightliness of youth that he led the nine fair warriors up the broad palace steps then turning he addressed his court these are the war maidens he said who come to guard our kingdom from its enemies it is their mission to ride up and down in all the world to choose the bravest heroes who have fallen in battle and to bring them to valhalla with all these heroes we shall be protected from peril in the evil days to come then wotan introduced each war maiden by name beginning with brunhilde who was the strongest and the loveliest and they were welcomed royally to the palace by all who lived therein the golden apples of life were given them to eat and they became immortal day by day the war maidens rode forth into battle seeking for the bravest men whenever they found one who had fallen in the forefront of conflict they carried him to valhalla where he became immortal there was much fighting in the world in those days so the palace soon received many mighty soldiers and wotan grew light of heart for now he thought he could defy the dwarf's curse and all the powers of the underworld so he trained his soldiers constantly and had them continually in battle one against another and if one by chance received a wound it healed of itself through magic power still the loss of the gold and of the ring was an ever-present danger wotan knew this and cast about for some means to restore the treasure to the rhine daughters so that the peril might be removed now fafner the giant had taken the gold to a cave in the midst of a dense forest by the aid of the magic helmet he had changed himself into a fierce dragon and in this shape he guarded the mouth of the cave night and day so you see that he wasn't getting very much pleasure out of his hoard being a god wotan of course knew where fafner the dragon lay hid but neither he nor any of the gods could attack fafner or lay hands upon the treasure it had been given the giant in open barter and so was beyond their recall but wotan reasoned that if some earth-born hero could be found brave enough to slay the dragon the gold could be secured 
Failing this, the dwarf Albrecht might in the end be crafty enough to regain it and wreak his vengeance upon the gods. The peril was still great, therefore, in spite of the warriors in Valhalla. Wotan realized all this and resolved to journey again through the world in quest of a hero to attack the dragon. For many days he searched without success. Then he chose a son of his own for the great task, living with him as a simple forester while the boy grew up, and training him to warlike deeds. The boy's name was Siegmund, and as he reached young manhood, he was straight as a young pine tree in the forest, and strong as the oak which defies the winds of heaven. While Siegmund was still a youth, a great sorrow befell him. Sieglinda, a young girl of his own age with whom he had grown up, and whom he looked upon as a sister, was seized by a fierce hunter and carried away to his home in the forest. For many months Siegmund sought to rescue her, but without success. He grew to manhood with this object before him, and vowed eternal warfare against the hunter and all his clan, a vow Wotan aided him to keep, until the very name of Siegmund became a terror to the hunter. Then another sudden grief befell the young warrior. Wotan mysteriously went away one day, leaving no trace and no message, save that when Siegmund should be in direst need, he would find a trusty sword at hand to aid him. Siegmund now felt forsaken indeed, and he roamed about aimlessly in the forests, hunting the wild beasts, helping people in distress, or fighting against the hunter's tribe. One night, utterly spent from his wanderings, he sought shelter in a house built in a peculiar manner round the trunk of a great oak tree. Seeing no one within the main room, he entered, closed the door behind him, and lay down exhausted in front of the fire, where he soon fell fast asleep. Presently a maiden came into the room. She expected to find the hunter there, for this was none other than his house, although Siegmund did not know it. When, instead of the master of the house, the maiden saw the stranger lying upon the hearth, she sprang back in sudden fear. But the poor man did not move, so she came gently to his side to see whether he were alive or dead. Siegmund stirred uneasily in his sleep, then, wakening, tried to utter a few words, but his parched lips gave forth little sound. Seeing his pitiable state, the maiden hastened to give him a drink. It revived him somewhat, and he sat up and gazed around. The maiden gave him more of the cup, and gently asked him whence he came. He answered, and began telling her of his wanderings, without revealing his name. Just then the hunter himself arrived, but neither he nor Siegmund recognized the other as his sworn enemy, and the hunter, noting the young man's distressed condition, bade him welcome for the night, and invited him to the table to share his food. Siegmund accepted the invitation joyfully, and soon found his strength returning to him in the meat and drink. In answer to his host's questions, he told the story of his past adventures, and the hunter found for the first time that his guest was the foe whom he had long been seeking to slay. "'Ha! I know you now!' he exclaimed, springing to his feet. "'It is you who have done so much harm to me and mine.' I would make you answer for your deeds here and now, were it not for the sacred laws of hospitality. But to-morrow I shall meet you. At sunrise be ready to fight and give me full satisfaction. Siegmund was astonished in his turn, but could not refuse the challenge. The hunter left him with these words, bidding the maiden also go into another room. Left to himself, the young man fell again into heaviness of spirit, it seemed to him that sorrow and trouble had followed him all the days of his life. He mused over his present defenseless condition, alone, unarmed, and under his enemy's very roof. Then he recalled his father's promise, that a sword would be ready at his hand when his need was direst. Somehow the thought of this promise brought comfort to him, and he fell into a quiet slumber. After a time, during the stillness of night, a door opened softly, and the maiden came toward him. Up, she said, gently rousing him, up and flee for your life. The hunter has been planning mischief against you, but I gave him a sleeping draught. Why should I flee, said Siegmund? Give me but a sword, and I turn my back upon no man. But who are you, fair lady, who do this kindness to a stranger? Methinks I have seen your face in earlier days than this. 
"'And I also seem to remember you,' she answered, gazing at him earnestly. "'My story is not a long one, but it is sad. "'When I was a little girl, this cruel hunter carried me away from home, "'and he has compelled me to live with him ever since. "'But one day during a feast a strange-looking man with only one eye came in, "'bearing a mighty sword. "'He drove the sword to the hilt in the trunk of yonder tree with one sweep of his arm, declaring that it was for only one man, the man who should be able to pull it forth again. Many stout men that day and since have tried to claim the sword, but there it sticks. There you may see the firelight strike the handle. Perchance, poor stranger, it was left for you. Ah, now I know my father's words were true, Siegmund cried, joyously. See, the sword is mine and, laying hold of the handle, he drew the shining blade as easily as though the tree had been its scabbard. "'And thou also, I know, my heart's best. Thou art Sieglinde, for whom I have sought all these years. Dost thou not remember thine old playmate, Siegmund?' She gazed at him, first with startled look, then a tender light of memory and love dawned in her eyes. Siegmund stretched out his arms to her, and the two were united in a fond embrace. Come, said Siegmund, now will I flee, and thou must go with me. My father's sword shall shield us both, and never again while I live shall this robber have thee in his clutches. The moon was shining brightly on this warm night in early spring. The wide world seemed to beckon her two children forth, and answering her summons and the glad call of their own hearts, they fled away. King Wotan knew of all these things. He knew that his dearly loved son Siegmund had found the magic sword and had fled from the hunter's home. He foresaw also that the hunter would rise up full of wrath the next day and pursue Siegmund to kill him. This must be prevented. The god summoned Brunhilde before him. "'Wisest and fairest of war maidens,' he said, "'in yonder mountain gorge thou wilt discover a young man and a maiden who are dear to me.' The maiden has been stolen away from a hunter who held her against her will, and the hunter now pursues the young man with intent to slay him. It is my will that he be not slain, but that he gain the victory over the hunter. See thou to it. Brunhilde gladly listened to Wotan's behest. It shall be done as thou desirest, she exclaimed. Ho, yo, to ho! The musical shout of the war maidens came from her lips as she sprang from cliff to cliff and disappeared. But she had hardly gone before Fricka, Wotan's queen, entered in a chariot drawn by two rams. Now Fricka was goddess of love and justice, and it grieved her that Siegmund should be allowed to take Sieglinde away with him as he had done. "'Justice, O Wotan!' she cried, against the young man Siegmund. The hunter from whose house he fled away, carrying the maiden Sieglinde, has called to me for help, and I have promised to aid him. The hunter held the maiden against her will, replied Wotan. Nevertheless, his right to her had become recognized among men, so she must be restored to him, else men will say that there is no justice in the world. Wotan's brow was wrinkled moodily. He knew that Sieglinde had dwelt so many years under the hunter's roof that all men believed she rightfully belonged there. Yet in his heart he longed to protect his son. Fricka saw the struggle, but would not relent. She added many words to what she had said, and urged her case so strongly that every law the gods had made seemed enlisted in the hunter's cause. At last Wotan, heavy in spirit, agreed to give the victory to him. After Fricka had departed, he called Brunhilde again to him, and told her of his last decision. Brunhilde was full of grief when she learned that she must aid the hunter against Siegmund. "'Why dost thou do this, O father?' she asked gently. "'Because the laws of the gods demand it,' he answered. Then the sorrow-stricken Wotan unburdened his heart to her, and told her of the Rhinegold, of the ring that had been fashioned from it, of the curse that had followed, and of many other things which we have set forth in this book. "'The curse of the ring is the fate of Siegmund,' he concluded. "'That is why I am powerless to protect him.' see that thou dost obey my latest command so saying he departed amid the rumblings of a thunder-cloud leaving brunhilde full of sorrow at the strange tale she had heard and the sad errand she must perform 
but she turned her steps dutifully down the mountain gorge and there in a sheltering cave she found the young man and maiden sieglinda had become tired out from their wanderings and siegmund had borne her into the cave and was supporting her head upon his knee while smoothing back the stray locks of gold from her lovely forehead so intent was he upon this devotion that he did not see brunhilde when she came into the entrance if the war maiden had longed to befriend these two before she saw them how much more did her heart soften when she beheld this sweet picture but her duty must be done she called softly to siegmund and he raised his head i am the war maiden she said and am sent to warn thee of thy fate thine enemy follows hard upon thy heels and none who look upon my face survive a battle i fear not for the battle answered siegmund stoutly this magic sword was left me by my father and with it i must surely be victorious it will avail thee not for the gods have decreed that thou must die but glory awaits thee in valhalla whither i am summoned to bear thee after death what is valhalla he asked it is the hall of heroes among whom thou wilt be first will i find my father there and my sweet comrade sieglinda the search for these two had consumed the youthful warrior's whole life so his voice trembled eagerly as he asked the question brunhilde smiled then shook her head sadly thy father yes in valhalla shalt thou find him but sieglinda cannot come to thee there then take my greetings to valhalla he exclaimed greet for me wotan hail to my father and all the heroes hail the war maidens for now i follow not thee by this time brunhilde's heart had become so touched that she boldly resolved to disobey wotan's last command and do as he really desired smiling upon siegmund she bade him be of good heart as she had only been testing his courage then she told him she would be with him and aid him in the coming strife even while she spoke the hunter's horn was heard and soon the man himself came hastening fiercely along he did not see siegmund at first for a heavy storm had come up while the heavens seemed rent with terrific crashes of thunder the din finally aroused the sleeping sieglinda and she gazed around wildly siegmund had sprung out of the cave to confront his enemy and there in front of the cave he stood revealed by a flash of lightning battling strongly with the hunter sieglinda uttered a cry of grief and was about to rush between them when another sudden blaze of light made her draw back at one side she beheld the war maiden standing ready to protect siegmund the young man pressed upon the hunter and was about to strike him to the earth with his trusty sword when a glowing red flame burst through the clouds wotan himself appeared with his dread spear and stretched it across the sword the magic blade broke in sunder and siegmund fell dead pierced by the hunter's weapon but the hunter himself did not survive the conflict for a glance from the single blazing eye of the angry god stretched him lifeless on the sward when wotan appeared brunhilde started back amazed and fearful she began to realize what it meant to disobey the god's command hastily seizing the fainting form of sieglinda she sprang upon her winged steed and fled swiftly from the tragic scene far and fast through the storm she sped glancing around fearfully ever and anon and fancying each rumble of the thunder was wotan's voice then she turned her horse's head toward the summit of a lofty crag it was the usual meeting-place of all the war maidens on their way to valhalla soon the crag came in sight and there awaiting her were her eight companions hailing her swift approach with hoyo to ho their battle cry hardly taking time to answer their joyous greetings brunhilde placed sieglinde gently on the ground and cried save us o oh my sister save us from the wrath of wotan why what crime hast thou committed cried the other war maidens in alarm i have disobeyed the god's command and even now he rides hard after me under the wings of the tempest save this innocent mortal at least she has done no wrong i do not wish for life exclaimed sieglinde who had just recovered consciousness why should i live when siegmund is dead i pray you draw your sword and slay me 
Not so, said Brunhilde soothingly. The fates decree that thou must live. And see, I have saved for thee the sword of need, which was broken in Siegmund's hands. Keep it for his son, the hero who shall know no fear, and he shall do mighty deeds with the mended blade. So saying, Brunhilde drew from the folds of her cloak the two pieces of the broken sword and gave them to Sieglinde, and whispered in her ear words of tenderness and balm. And Sieglinde's face lost its hopeless look, and she promised to go wherever the war-maiden might direct. Haste thee then, urged Brunhilde, the time is short. In only one place wilt thou be safe from Wotan, and that is the depth of yonder forest. There dwells Fafner the dragon, and there Wotan never ventures because of the curse of the ring. The tempest had increased in fury while Brunhilde was speaking. The dense darkness shielded Sieglinde while she hurried away. She was scarce gone, hugging the precious sword, when a terrific clap of thunder shook the whole cliff, and Wotan appeared in a flash of light. "'Brunhilde! Brunhilde!' he called. Brunhilde did not answer, and the other war-maidens, braving his anger through loyalty and love for their sister, hid her in their midst. "'Brunhilde!' again thundered Wotan. "'Stand forth! Art afraid to hear thy doom?' "'Not so, O mighty father,' replied Brunhilde, and she stepped forward proudly, and knelt at his feet. "'Ah, Brunhilde, how couldst thou disobey my command?' asked Wotan, more in sadness than in anger. "'Thou hast brought thy fate upon thyself.' "'I but tried to save one who was dear to thee,' she answered. "'But thou didst violate my will, and henceforth can be a war-maiden no more.' Thou must descend to earth, lose thy immortality, and live the life of any other woman. On hearing this terrible decree, by which she lost the rank of goddess, Brunhilde sank upon the ground with a piteous cry. Have mercy, O Wotan, she pleaded. I tried to meet the wishes of thy heart, as given in thy first command. Do not banish me forever from my dear sisters and thy beloved presence. Have mercy. "'Have mercy!' cried her sisters, stretching out their hands towards the god. "'Silence!' said Wotan solemnly. "'I have spoken, and it must be done. "'O oh, dearly loved maiden, how gladly would I save thee if it were so decreed! "'But thou must sink to the ground in deep sleep, "'and it shall come to pass that in after years the man who shall awaken thee "'shall claim thee for his bride.' As for ye other maidens, he continued, glancing around with a flash of the eye, beware how ye fail to keep faith with me again, and come not again into my presence this day. The war maidens fled in woe and terror at this speech, leaving Brunhilde and Wotan alone upon the rock. The sky was clearing, the wind was dying away, and the moon came forth and looked down upon the scene. There was silence for many long moments until Brunhilde, unable to endure it, rose slowly to her feet in all her beauty and pride, yet with wild entreaty in her voice. "'Oh, father, father!' she pleaded. "'Save me from this fate, for the honour of all the gods. Do not place me within reach of any coward among men who might chance to awaken me. If I must fall asleep to wake a mortal woman, grant me this last request.' place me in some spot so hedged about with danger that none but the bravest of all men may find me and claim me for his own wotan gazed at her all the old love and pride for her shining in his eyes he gently drew her to him and kissed her upon the eyelids it shall be as thou dost wish he said I shall shield thee with a barrier of living fire, so that none save a true hero can rescue thee. And now farewell, my darling child. How I shall miss thee in Valhalla, and on our rides of glory, thou dost little know. Farewell, farewell. Brunhilde clasped her arms around his neck and smiled for the last time in his face. He bent down and kissed her again, and yet again. A deep sleep came over her, and she sank slowly down. Wotan carried her tenderly to a low mound of moss upon the very crest of the towering rock, and there he placed his shield over her to protect her from all harm. 
again he gazed long and mournfully on her features then closed the visor of the helmet she wore and turning began a mystic waving of his spear of authority he ended by summoning loki god of fire loki hark hitherward haste as i found thee first in a fiery waste as once thou didst fly in fiery display as then i did call thee i call thee to-day arise with thy flaming encircle this place to daunt the craven whom my spear could not face loki loki arise at the last call he struck the rock thrice with his spear and instantly a stream of fire gushed forth and licked upward in tongues of flame from every side higher and wider they spread leaping and crackling till they formed a complete circle round the mossy bed where brunhilde lay sleeping and as they swept upward in the night air they seemed to blend in strains of music sweet as the strumming of a harp and soft as the lullaby of a mother crooning her child to sleep end of story two part one story three of tales from wagner by j walker mcspadden this librivox recording is in the public domain part one the ring of the curse story three siegfried the fearless several years passed by while brunhilde lay in her enchanted sleep summers and winters came and went yet still she lay there unharmed in her magic circle of fire and growing no whit older than when she first sank down in slumber in all her youth and beauty down in the depths of the forest far below the crag on which she rested fafner the dragon still guarded the rhine golden ring he had come to be known only as the dragon because giant though he was he had always been afraid to leave this hideous shape lest someone should overcome him and seize the treasure and he had good cause to fear although the gold bore a curse with it there was more than one who sought to lay hand upon it wotan the mighty had even forsaken the beautiful palace of valhalla which cost him so much and was now roaming over the earth seeking some hero to slay the dragon he had indeed come to be known as the wanderer because of his constant search the dwarfs also had by no means forgotten the glittering hoard which had been taken away from them albrecht went about in sullen discontent biding his time while mime his brother who had made the magic helmet could not forget the gold night or day mime knew where the dragon lay hid so he set about laying plans to outwit or slay him now the dwarfs had always lived deep down in the caves of the earth they had seemed actually afraid of the sunlight and it may be that they were afraid of their own shadows for no greater cowards ever lived but with all their cowardice they were sly and had a wonderful faculty of finding out all sorts of secrets mime had discovered the whole story of the gold the helmet the ring the curse the building of valhalla and the dread which had fallen upon the gods he learned of all this and many other things and he laughed and rubbed his hands craftily ah he said i will find a way to seize the ring and rule the whole world i will watch this dragon day and night and sooner or later i shall surprise him so mime the dwarf summoned up courage enough to appear above ground he betook himself to fafner's forest where he soon found the huge monster crouched before the door of his cave for many days and nights mime lay hid waiting for a chance to slip past the great beast but no such chance came i shall have to kill him said mime to himself and at the bare thought his teeth chattered with fear but even if i had a sword stout enough and long enough to reach his heart i should never have courage enough to wield it this thought was very discouraging to him yet he was unwilling to give up hope of the gold for many more days he pondered and plotted till at last he thought of a plan i have it he exclaimed slapping his thigh i shall build a blacksmith's forge hard by here in the wood where i shall make nothing but swords at last my skill will bring forth the best blade in the world and i shall offer it to the mightiest hero who may come riding by 
Who knows? Perhaps one will be found brave enough to fight the dragon when I tell him just how to do it. Then, after he kills the dragon, well, we will see. He chuckled at the cunning plan he had made, while the evil light in his eyes boded no good for the after-fate of the chosen hero. This plan seemed wild, yet it was the best that offered, so mime began at once. He built his smithy, and having been used to this trade all his life in the underworld, he speedily felt quite at home. Soon his forge fires shone brightly through the forest, and the sound of his hammering disturbed the birds and beasts. One day, during a lull in his work, he heard a faint tap at his door. He asked harshly who was there, but receiving no reply, he peered cautiously outside. There on the threshold lay a poor woman feebly holding a little child in her arms. Her strength seemed spent, and even the rough mime felt pity for her distress. He carried her into the smithy and laid her near the forge fire, then hastened to pour some cordial down her throat. The drink revived her slightly, and she sat up and tried to lift the child. "'Take care of him!' she gasped. "'His name is Siegfried. He comes from a race of heroes.' "'How am I to know that he is of hero-born?' asked the dwarf bluntly. "'Here, here!' she answered eagerly, drawing some fragments of a sword from the folds of her dress. "'It was his father's sword, the wonderful sword of need. Keep it safe for him, and he shall do mighty deeds.' Her voice trailed into silence, and the dwarf bending down perceived that she was dead. It was poor Sieglinde who had hid away from the wrath of Wotan as Brunhilde had bidden her. At last her sad life was ended, and perchance her spirit found peace with that of Sigmund in some happier clime. Mime now turned his attention to the little child for the first time. He saw that its limbs were sturdily knit, and that already it held its head erect and looked one squarely in the eye, which was more than the dwarf had ever done in his whole life. "'Who knows?' muttered Mime. "'This may be the hero for whom I have been waiting. I will bring him up as my son and train him to my set purpose. At any rate, he could soon be useful blowing the fire.' So he adopted the little Siegfried and cared for him, during his helpless days, in a dwarf's rude way. He hollowed out a log for the baby's cradle and spread a bearskin over it. He gave him goat's milk to drink and let him play with the broken handles of swords. Every fair morning he carried him out into the bright sunshine and left him to kick his heels and shout back answers to the singing birds. But the dwarf himself rarely ventured outdoors. He seemed to prefer the soot and smoke of his forge fire. He hammered away and hummed a moody tune, and took comfort in thinking of the day when this foster child should be sent to slay the dragon. But if Mime had expected the lad to mend the fires and work in the shop, he soon found himself mistaken. The little fellow thrived wonderfully and took to the life of the forest naturally. On the other hand, he had no use for the forge, or it must be confessed, for his foster father. He soon came to despise the dwarf as a coward, for he himself showed no fear of anything. So he roamed every day in the forest, returning only at nightfall with some animal he had slain. Once he harnessed a wild bear with ropes and drove it into the blacksmith's shop, nearly causing Mime to fly out of his wits from terror. When Siegfried arrived at young manhood, he was a goodly sight to look upon. His limbs were strong and powerful, yet rounded and graceful. His skin was tinged with the ruddy hue of outdoor life. His fair hair fell in soft curls to his shoulders, as the manner then was, and his blue eyes met one's look frankly and fearlessly. Though he had been taught to look upon Mime as his father, Siegfried soon rejected this belief with scorn. He felt no love for the dwarf, such as a son would feel, and he could not help contrasting his own powerful frame and courage with the smith's weak, cringing way. The only tie which now bound them together was a promise made by the dwarf that he would forge a sword with which Siegfried could win every battle. The young man waited impatiently for this sword to be made, and Mime actually worked early and late to finish it. 
but alas no sooner would he temper a blade so that it seemed perfect when siegfried would return from the chase and say ho oh, this is the sword you have made for me to-day and he would shiver it to bits upon the anvil this went on day after day until siegfried lost all patience and began to threaten the dwarf hark you mime he cried give me the stout blade you promised or it will not go well with you to-morrow night you would not harm your father whined the dwarf remember how i cared for you and sheltered you i have long since paid that score in meat and skins answered siegfried and as for you being my father you know that is false answer me directly i would know who my father was his manner was so threatening that the dwarf was thoroughly frightened i i do not know who your father was he stammered your mother was sieglinda a poor woman whom i sheltered here when you were a baby she gave me an old broken sword see here it is and he rummaged beneath a pile of skins and brought to light the pieces of the magic sword of need ha that is good metal cried siegfried as he examined it i will have no sword but this see to it that tis mended for me gainst another knight the smith promised though in a quaking voice for he was by no means certain that he could mend the weapon his fears were well founded when he tried to do so the next day the pieces refused to unite in his hands after making repeated attempts he sank down behind the anvil in despair at this moment a strange-looking man entered the doorway he was tall and powerful he wore a long dark cloak and carried a spear instead of a staff on his head was a large hat whose broad brim shaded one eye that was evidently injured or missing the wanderer muttered the dwarf in abject fear it was indeed wotan the wanderer what are you doing here he demanded in a voice of thunder pointing to the broken blade i i am trying to mend the the, the sword of need said the dwarf he knew there was no use in telling an untruth as wotan had already recognized the weapon where did you get it wotan asked twas given me by sieglinda the mother of siegfried mercy mercy i, I cannot mend it peace fool you speak truth no one but the hero who knows no fear can weld those pieces together so saying he struck his spear upon the floor with a noise like thunder and turning strode away into the forest mime dared not look after him or ask any questions indeed he was in such utter terror that he did not venture from behind the anvil where he lay hid all day and here it was that siegfried found him when he returned home mime have you got my sword done yet he called pardon pardon whined the dwarf oh i have had such an awful scare a scare what is that asked siegfried i mean i have been in dreadful fear answered mime fear what is that asked siegfried know you not what fear is said mime starting up and remembering wotan's words that only the hero who knew no fear could mend the sword the young man shook his head mime pressed the subject further suppose you should meet a great monster in the forest he said a huge dragon whose eyes and mouth shot fire whose tail lashed this way and that tearing down the trees whose tongue was sharp as a sword and whose terrible fangs could crush you like an insect suppose this terrible dragon should come rushing down to devour you how would you feel there is no such beast as that replied siegfried smiling oh but there is urged the dwarf his own eyes growing big with alarm as he thought of fafner there is down in the depths of this very forest lurks a dragon ten times more dreadful than i have said he lies crouched in a thicket before a cave and even the gods are afraid to come near him then he would be worth fighting exclaimed siegfried with flashing eyes forge me this sword as you promised and then show me the way to his lair i cannot mend the blade confessed mime sullenly only he who has no fear in his heart can mend it or wield it siegfried glanced at him a moment in anger then as if despairing of getting the dwarf to do the work he seized the fragments with one hand and the bellows with the other stand aside he commanded i will mend the blade 
and he set to work while the dwarf looked on in wonder. First Siegfried took a file and began rubbing the steel into fine powder. Stop! screamed the dwarf. You are ruining it! Oh, no, I am not, laughed Siegfried, filing the faster. Soon the sword, all but the handle, was changed into powder. Then Siegfried placed the powder over the fire and blew a bright blaze underneath it, and as he worked the bellows he sang from pure joy in his work. Ho, 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 ha, hi, ha, hi, bellows blow the flame on high. The sword of need will soon be made, and then aloft I shall flash my blade. Ho, 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 ha, hi, ha, hi, bellows blow the blaze on high. Deep in the wood there lived a tree, its ashes here in the flames I see. Ho, 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 ha, hi, ha, hi, bellows blow the tree must die but the flashing fire hath won its way it sputters and flares in the metal spray when he finished the song the powder had become a molten mass he ran this into a mould and plunged it into the water the loud hiss of cooling metal was heard presently he seized the new blade with a pair of pincers and heated it red hot allowing it to remain but a moment in the coals he placed it upon the anvil and beat it mighty blows till the blade was sharp and thin then heating it once more he fastened it to the handle he swung the weapon critically and tested its temper again he heated it and beat it till the shop was filled with flying sparks but now it emerged bright and keen the most perfect blade in all the world and triumphantly he sang ah sword of need anew thou art wrought back into life and strength thou art brought see mime this is the sword i wished you to forge and making the sword whistle about his head he brought it down squarely upon the anvil from top to bottom the heavy anvil was cleaved falling into two pieces with a thunderous noise farewell cried siegfried the smithy sees me no more from this day i go to seek the dragon and he hurried forth with his wonderful new sword into the forest wait a minute called mime running after him you cannot find the cave unless i show you the way i thought you were too great a coward for that laughed siegfried who's afraid panted the dwarf as he caught up with him besides i'm only going to point out the place you are the one that's going to be eaten in fact mime was quite anxious to have the young man meet the dragon no matter how the fight turned out he reasoned that he himself would be the gainer in the event of siegfried killing the beast and escaping unharmed mime intended to give him a poisonous draught which he had prepared then with both these foes out of the way the dwarf believed that the wonderful gold of the curse would be his without any further struggle but in this mime was wrong for his brother albrecht who had first stolen the gold from the rhine maidens was even then watching the dragon's cave and had been on guard there night and day wotan the wanderer found him there upon the day of fate and unheeding the dwarf's taunts and reproaches told him of siegfried's and mime's approach albrecht now hid behind some rocks to watch what would happen see that is the cave said mime pointing it out to siegfried when they were still some distance away i can go no further as i am very tired from running to catch up with you but go straight ahead and i wish you success and the dragon an equal amount the last words he muttered to himself then scurried for a safe place where he could watch the fight it was a beautiful morning and the birds were caroling sweetly in the treetops Siegfried cast himself down upon the sward to rest himself and enjoy the quiet sylvan scene a little while. The birds seemed to be talking to him. He could not understand their sweet language, but he tried to imitate it upon a reed whistle. Failing in his attempt, he seized the horn which was slung around his shoulders and blew a loud, clear note as a challenge to the dragon. At once a tremendous crashing sound was heard in a nearby thicket ah that must be the dragon said siegfried craning his neck without getting up again he heard the roar followed by a terrible snorting and hissing and yawning and out came a huge lizard-like serpent plunging through the underbrush toward him who are you it growled oh you can talk can you said siegfried 
I am a man who has been sent to you to learn what fear is. You will find out if you live long enough, roared the dragon, showing its fangs and licking out a long forked tongue. I will devour you in two mouthfuls. Oh, no, laughed Siegfried, I object. But if you do not teach me what fear is, it will be the worse for you. This taunt angered the dragon as Siegfried intended. It sprang forward, lashing about with its tail, and poured forth flame and smoke from its nostrils. Siegfried leaped easily to one side and evaded both dangers. The dragon turned upon him at close range and struck again with its tail. Siegfried vaulted high in the air so that the tail swept the ground smoothly under him without touching. Quick as a flash he smote the scaly back with his keen sword so that the black blood poured forth in torrents. The dragon uttered loud bellows of rage and pain and reared upon Siegfried with the forepart of its body in order to crush him. But as it reared its breast was exposed and Siegfried was swift to seize his advantage. With a powerful blow he drove the sword of need up to the hilt in the monster's heart. "'Woe is me!' gasped the dragon, rolling upon the earth in a dying condition. "'Reckless youth, do you know what you've done?' "'I know I have slain a foul beast because he would not teach me fear.' "'Ah, I perceive you are the tool of others,' said the dragon in a weak voice. "'Know then that I am Fafner, the last of the giant's race.' I guarded the Rhinegold, but beware of it. A curse follows all who possess it. Beware. Then, with a dreadful groan, the dragon expired. Siegfried drew his sword from its breast, and as he did so, a drop of blood fell upon his hand. It burned like a coal of fire, and instinctively he licked it with his tongue to stop the pain. Suddenly a strange new power came upon him. He knew not what it was, but stood silent and amazed, waiting to discover what it could be. Then in the silence a bird sang to him from a linden tree, the same song he had heard before, but this time he could understand it. It was as though the bird were speaking his own tongue. "'The Rhinegold is now yours,' it sang. "'There in the cave you will find it. Be careful to take also the helmet of darkness and the ring of power.' Siegfried thanked the friendly bird and hastened into the cave. While he was gone, Mime and Albrecht crept up and for the first time became aware of each other's presence. A violent quarrel at once began as to which should claim the treasure, but it was speedily silenced by the return of Siegfried clad in shining armor and bearing the helmet and ring. The two dwarfs slunk away again, unperceived by the young man, who walked thoughtfully along, listening to the wood bird, which had recommenced its song. And these were the words of the song. Ha! Siegfried now holds both the helmet and the ring. Beware of sly mime, trust him not in anything. Siegfried again thanked the bird for its warning, which was indeed timely, for Mime now approached him, with great pretended delight in his safety. "'Have you learned what fear is?' he asked with a grin. "'No, I have not,' answered Siegfried. "'Then sit you down and rest, bravest of men,' said the dwarf, "'and see, here is a cooling cup of mead I have brought for you. It will quiet you and cause you to forget your weariness.' "'It is poison,' retorted the young man. "'Thanks to the dragon's blood I can read all your wicked heart. "'Wretch, take your just deserts.' "'With that he dashed the poison cup to the ground "'and stretched the dwarf with one blow, dead at his feet. "'It was his life or mine at the last,' he said, "'as he wended his way thoughtfully into the forest. "'In spite of his victory over the dragon, he was not elated.' Instead, he was thinking how barren his life had been without friends or kindred, and how aimless it seemed even now, despite the gold. Sighing heavily, he sat down upon a log and buried his face in his hands. "'Lonely, lonely, of all men I am most lonely,' he cried. "'Would you find a love to comfort you?' sang the clear voice of the bird over his head. "'I know where you can find the fairest lady in the world.' On a lofty crag she sleeps, her guard is a flaming fire, and he must bravely pierce the blaze who would win his heart's desire. Siegfried sprang to his feet. 
"'This quest is to my liking. Tell me more about it!' he exclaimed. "'The bride to win, Brunhilde to wake, is no coward's task, or to whom fear doth shake.' Thus sang the woodbird again, and Siegfried listened to him joyfully. "'Show me the way to the lofty crag, I pray you, good bird,' he exclaimed. "'Show me the way that I may greet the lady, or look into the face of fear.' By way of answer the little bird fluttered away toward the heights leading up to the mountainside. Siegfried eagerly followed, over stones, through thickets, beneath huge trees, across dangerous chasms, but always being careful not to lose sight of the bird. At last they came to a wild, rocky gorge, extending to the last line of cliffs, and there the bird suddenly disappeared. But Siegfried saw a narrow chasm like a giant's pathway leading upward to the crest, and this, he decided, was the route he must follow. After a last look to see where the bird had gone, he prepared to ascend the path when he came face to face with Wotan. Siegfried had never seen the god before, and now was in no wise dismayed, although the strange-looking figure in long cloak and broad hat was larger and more commanding than any he had ever met before this day. In Wotan's hand was the spear of authority with which he ruled the world. "'Where are you going?' asked the god. I know not, replied Siegfried. A little bird told me of a rock surrounded by fire, and of a lovely maiden who sleeps there. But now the bird is gone, and I must find my way alone. Do you not fear the fire? Fear? That also have I come to seek. Know you the way? It lies up through yonder rift, replied Wotan, wishing to test the young man's bravery yet further. But the journey is one of terror. Upon the mountain top the flames leap fiercely. Sheets of fire driven before the wind rage on every side. The fiery foe I challenge, answered Siegfried. I must rescue Brunhilde at any cost. And he strode toward the rocky chasm. Back, rash youth, commanded Wotan, stretching out his spear. You shall not pass while this all-powerful weapon prevents. "'It shall not prevail against this magic blade,' replied Siegfried, drawing the sword of need. Wotan started at sight of the fateful blade. "'Where got you the weapon?' he asked. "'At Mime's forge I made it, the best metal in the world. "'But it shall not avail against the spear, for by it was the sword first broken,' answered Wotan. "'Ah!' cried Siegfried, rushing forward. "'Then you were my father's foe.' on guard before my sword brings vengeance upon you he swung the sword with terrific force through the air it met the spear with a crash like thunder and the once powerful spear was broken the owner of the ring was indeed master of the world go forward said wotan sadly no longer can i hold you the doom of the gods was foretold before you came into the world you are but the instrument of fate and he disappeared. Siegfried glanced at the spot where he had stood in astonishment. Then, seeing no further bar to his progress, he ran lightly up the rough pathway. Presently he heard a dull roaring sound, and saw, on the mountain height, a huge mass of flames which leaped in every direction, and seemed to touch the very sky. Red and wrathful they shone, shutting off the pathway by what appeared to be a solid body of fire, while clouds of smoke hid the view on every side. But Siegfried pressed forward undaunted. Putting his hunting-horn to his lips, he sounded a merry note as if in challenge, and as he went on a wonderful thing happened. The fire parted slightly to right and left, letting him pass by unharmed. On he went until he came to the inner circle which the flame had guarded, and now it vanished utterly, leaving the blue sky and the free air of heaven. On the moss-covered rock Siegfried saw someone lying asleep beneath a heavy shield. He lifted this and beheld what appeared to be a youth clad in bright armor. The helmet hid the face, but when he carefully removed the heavy headdress, a mass of beautiful golden hair was loosened. The features were those of the lovely Brunhilde. "'Ah, it is not a man!' exclaimed Siegfried, gazing at the face in rapture. "'It is the maid I have come to seek. How still she is! How can I waken her from this slumber?' He tried gently to rouse her by calling, but there was no response. 
Only her deep breathing told him that she was alive. "'Tis the fairest vision I could ever have dreamed of seeing,' he murmured. "'The one maid I could worship and serve. Now I cannot waken her, and all my past hardships have been in vain.' He knelt down and gazed long and rapturously into her face. Then, unable to restrain his emotions any longer, he bent and pressed his lips full and fervently upon hers. Instantly the maid awoke. While Siegfried started back in rapture, she sat up as easily as though yesterday had witnessed the beginning of her long sleep. She gazed about her in delight and burst forth into a little cry of gladness. Hail to thee, sun! Hail to thee, light! Hail, thou luminous day! Deep was my sleep, long was the night. Then, looking about, she asked, Who is the hero that has come to awaken me? I am Siegfried, he replied modestly. Siegfried, son of Sieglinde, she cried. Then I knew your mother in those past years before I fell asleep. Ah, tell me of her and of my father, he exclaimed, his eyes shining. But I am not thoughtful, he added in another tone. You are in need of refreshment after your long slumber. I am a daughter of the gods, she answered, and feel no faintness or weariness as mortals do. Siegfried, who had come near to her, drew back as though struck by a blow. A daughter of the gods, he exclaimed. I, I hope to claim you for my bride. In his ingenuous youth, his inner thoughts rose naturally to his lips. Brunhilde smiled sadly and shook her head. See yonder horse, which also has been asleep, she asked. It is Grani, my winged steed, upon which I used to ride through the clouds with my sisters. Would you bid me stay upon earth? Ah, Brunhilde, my love is selfish, I know, but if your heart could feel half the fire that burns in mine, you would gladly stay upon earth like other women. Like other women? The words brought back the decree of Wotan in a flash, and Brunhilde sat as though stunned. Then she looked proudly at the fearless hero with his frank face and deep blue eyes, and as she looked the love-light shining in his face was lit upon her own. Siegfried knelt and pressed his lips to her hands with bowed head. He dared not look again for very joy, and afraid lest the light he had seen should be vanished. "'Brunhilde, Brunhilde!' he whispered. "'Can it be true?' For answer, Brunhilde clasped her arms round his neck and looked up lappingly into the sky. And again she sang, this time a note of glad renunciation. The proud war-maiden, the daughter of the gods, had found a joy in the mortal life of a loving woman, such as she had never dreamed. Away, Valhalla, glorious world! Farewell, thou gorgeous realm of the gods! End in the light, O lofty race! Night of destruction, thy terrors are gone. I stand in the glow of Siegfried's star. Then Siegfried, in his turn, sang of love and Brunhilde, and the two sweet voices blended together at the last in a triumphant strain. My own forever and parting never, for I and ever shining in love and smiling at death. End of story three. Part One, Story Four of Tales from Wagner by J. Walker McSpadden. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part One, Story Four, The Downfall of the Gods, Goethe Demerum. When Brunhilde promised to become Siegfried's wife, she well knew what it would cost her. She would no longer be of the family of the gods, nor would she have strength and wisdom beyond other mortal women. Yet she now had no regrets. Her love for her hero eclipsed every other thing, and she knew only that she was entirely happy in the present. Long the lovers sat and talked, forgetful of all the outside world. Siegfried told Brunhilde of his adventures, his fight with the dragon, his possession of the ring, and finally his encounter with the mysterious stranger whose spear he had shattered. Brunhilde started up at this. She had recognized Wotan at once from the description. 
"'The spear was broken, you say?' she exclaimed questioningly. "'Are you sure it was broken?' "'It fell shivered upon the ground beneath my sword.' "'What did the stranger do?' He looked sadly at me, saying that he was powerless to hinder me further, and then he vanished suddenly. "'Ah, woe to the gods!' ejaculated the maiden. "'Their doom is indeed coming upon them. "'Siegfried, the spear you broke was the dread spear of authority, "'with which the great Wotan ruled the world. "'Now all the old order of things shall pass away. "'Valhalla itself must fall because of the curse of the ring.' "'The curse of the ring?' asked Siegfried in an astonished voice. "'What is that?' "'It is the sad fate which has followed upon the heels of a bad deed,' she answered. "'King Wotan himself told me the tale upon that day so long ago when I disobeyed him.' She shuddered slightly at the memory, then went on. "'It is bound up in your own fate, so I will tell you also the story.' Then Siegfried listened with wide-open eyes while Brunhilde told him of the lost Rheingold, the building of Valhalla, the reward of the giants, the curse of the ring. His breath was baited and his eyes were very moist when she told him further of Siegmund and Sieglinde and the wrath of Wotan. "'Then you were the protector of my father and mother,' he said, embracing her joyfully. "'Ah, how much love and devotion do I owe you, fairest and dearest of goddess maidens!' "'Will you never forget me?' she asked. By way of reply he drew the magic ring from his finger and placed it upon hers. "'Let this be our troth,' he said. "'From this moment it becomes a blessing instead of a curse, and our lives shall be one life for evermore.' "'It shall tell me always of you,' answered Brunhilde, "'for I know you cannot linger here, dearly as I would desire it. "'You come of a race of heroes, and great deeds await you upon earth. "'Your sword must not grow rusty in idleness, nor your strength weak through ease.' "'Tis true,' he said, with a sad but resolute look in his blue eyes, "'as he glanced far over the nestling valleys. "'Tis true that my life-work is yet to be begun. "'But alas, Brunhilde, how can I leave you? "'You are the only person I have ever known "'that gave me sympathy or love.' "'Brunhilde pressed his hands tenderly. "'My sympathy and love shall always be for you,' she whispered, "'and here shall I wait your return to me.' Loki will build his barrier of fire about me once more, and only you, the hero who knows no fear, can find your way back again. And now take with you Grani, my good horse. He can no longer fly through the clouds as formerly when his mistress was one of the immortals, but he will go through fire and water for you, and will be your devoted slave." The maiden called the beautiful horse, which had been aroused out of sleep at the same time as she was awakened, and which was now grazing near by. Grani came to them whinnying gently. Siegfried patted the steed's soft nose, then took the bridle slowly, as if unwilling to speak. He girded on his sword, placed his helmet firmly upon his head, and slung his bugle around his shoulders. "'Farewell, beloved,' said Brunhilde softly. "'Farewell, beloved,' he answered. "'My hunting horn shall tell you from the valley all that I cannot say.' One lingering embrace, and he turned and led his steed down the steep path. Brunhilde watched his descent with shining eyes. Presently from the valley below she heard the mellow notes of the horn, sweet and clear." Then the faint gallop of hoofs told her that Siegfried had gone forth into the world to play the part fate gave him. Several days passed by. Grani steadily and swiftly bore his rider over mountains, through valleys, and across rivers with untiring zeal. It was not until they reached the noble river Rhine that Siegfried drew rein. Upon the crest of a hill across the stream from where they stood rose a splendid castle. It seemed to belong to the king of the country, for it was very large, and a pennant floated from an upper turret. The current of the river was deep and swift at this point, but a small boat was moored not far from Siegfried. 
Come, Granny, he said, dismounting. I will take the boat while you swim alongside me across the stream. This promises an adventure. Granny obeyed, and they were soon in the channel, heading toward the castle. Now this castle was the seat of a king of an ancient and warlike tribe. His name was Gunther, and he tried to deal fairly with every man. He had a beautiful sister, Gundrun, and also a half-brother named Hagen, a sly fellow who was always plotting mischief. Hagen, in fact, was the evil genius of the castle. You will not wonder at this when I tell you that he was of kin to the Nibelungs, Algric, and Mime. Like all of dwarf blood, Hagen had a passion for gold, and was also adept at discovering secrets. He knew of the stolen Rhine gold, and he had also learned, perhaps through Albrecht, of Siegfried's quest of Brunhilde. Thereupon he began to plot, and he told King Gunther just enough of his plotting to get the monarch's interest aroused. On this very day, when Siegfried had started across the river toward the castle, Hagen had been telling the king that he ought to find a queen, and then he told of the beauty of Brunhilde, and how she slept upon a lofty cliff surrounded by a barrier of fire. "'None but the bravest of heroes can rescue her,' Hagen continued. "'But there is one who is even now upon this quest. He is called the bravest of the brave, and his name is Siegfried.' Then, turning to Princess Gudrum, he added slyly, "'Perchance Siegfried is the hero you have been awaiting, O Princess.' He is handsome as he is brave. Now Gunther liked not the idea of another man being braver than he, but he only said, I should like much to see the fair Brunhilde, but if I could not pierce the flame, how could I persuade Siegfried to do so in my stead, seeing this is his own quest? Leave that to me, laughed Hagen. I will brew him a drink that would make him forget all his past his plans and wishes, and he would love the first lady his eyes fall upon. He looked again slyly at Gudrun, who blushed red, but wished within her heart that she could see the Siegfried. Her wish was soon to be gratified, for just as Hagen finished speaking, they heard the sound of a horn out on the river, blown in challenge. "'Who dares challenge Gunther in his own castle?' exclaimed the king, starting up. Hagen hurried to the battlements. "'I see a knight clad in glittering gold armor,' he said. "'He is in a boat alone, and by the boat swims a horse. "'With your favor I will meet him at the landing.' And Hagen seized sword and helmet and hastened out. King Gunther followed him, his curiosity being aroused by the challenge and Hagen's description. Together, in silence, they awaited the coming of the boat which made swift progress against the current, driven by Siegfried's muscular arms. Soon it touched the bank, and the young man sprang out. Drawing his sword, he saluted the two, and then placed himself on guard. "'I am Siegfried,' he said simply, "'and if any man gainsay my landing on these shores, I am ready to meet him in honourable combat.' "'Not so,' said Gunther, stretching out his hand cordially. "'If your name be Siegfried, then am I right glad to welcome you. "'Much have I heard of your prowess, and more would I fain hear while you rest yourself at my board. "'I am Gunther.' Siegfried looked at him frankly in the eye, then gripped his hand. Hagen also exchanged greetings with him, and led Granny away to the stables. Hagen was overjoyed at the turn affairs had taken. With his swift cunning he lost no time in putting his own schemes into play, and before he joined the king and his guest he found time to brew the drink of forgetfulness, about which he had told the king only a few minutes previously. Returning to the hall, Hagen found the king and his guest breaking bread together and chatting in a friendly way. Gunther, with true hospitality, had thrown open his home and realm to the hero. Siegfried, on his part, offered to serve the king with his sword and steed when any need should arise. "'But how did you know of me, or even that I am Siegfried?' he asked bluntly. "'We have already heard great things of your prowess,' replied Hagen, joining in the talk, "'and the magic helmet would betray you else.' "'The magic helmet?' repeated the young man. "'Yes, the cap of darkness you have at your belt. 
Have you never tried its wonderful properties? By its aid you can assume any shape you choose. Siegfried had never heard of the helmet's power before. He did not attempt to conceal his surprise, but said nothing. Just then the beautiful Princess Gudrun entered the room. She bore a golden salver upon which stood a goblet. She had already beheld the hero secretly, and now willingly brought him the fatal cup of forgetfulness which Hagen had made. "'Welcome to the palace of King Gunther,' she said with downcast eyes. "'Will my lord Siegfried drink a refreshing brew?' Siegfried thanked her courteously and placed the goblet to his lips. But though he bowed to her and the king, the toast which he whispered to himself was, "'To the health of my Brunhilde, may her memory never grow dim!' But alas, no sooner had he swallowed the potion than all his past life was blotted out. He seemed like one awakened from a heavy slumber, for he rubbed his eyes and glanced wildly about him. "'Where am I?' he asked, leaning upon a chair for support. "'What has happened?' Then his glance fell upon Gudrun, who stood silent and ashamed of what she had done. As he looked, a flame of love was kindled in his heart for her by the power of the magic draught. "'Who is this fair creature?' he asked, turning to the king. "'Is she your wife?' "'She is my sister,' answered Gunther. "'I have no wife.' It is not well for man to live alone, and all the more if he be king. That is what my brother Hagen has told me, but the one woman I could wish to win, methinks, is not attainable. How so? asked Siegfried. She is hedged about by a barrier of fire. A barrier of fire, said Siegfried slowly, and rubbing his eyes again, a barrier of fire? She can only be reached by one who is brave enough to force his way through the flame, continued Gunther, by one who knows no fear. One who knows no fear? Again repeated Siegfried. I knew such a man once, but he shook his head sadly and gave up trying to think. Yes, added the king, he who knows no fear can alone win Brunhilde for his bride. Siegfried made no immediate reply. The potion had done its full work, and he had utterly forgotten Brunhilde. Presently he said, I know not the maid of whom you speak, but methinks she could not be as fair as your sweet sister. Gudrum ran hastily from the room at this. I would be willing to go far to win her favor, he continued with the frankness of youth. Would you be willing to aid King Gunther's wooing? asked Hagen. Right gladly, answered Siegfried, but how? "'Your magic helmet would give you his appearance,' replied Hagen. "'That is, if you would dare face the barrier of fire.' Siegfried's eyes flashed. "'Dare? I dare anything, if only King Gunther and his fair sister give me their regard.' The king sprang to his feet quickly. "'Spoken like a man and a brother,' he exclaimed. "'Upon my soul I love you, and if you will obtain Brunhilde for me, I will undertake to win Gudrun for you. Done, said Siegfried, grasping his hand. I shall go with you when you wish. Then the king ordered wine to be poured. Come, drink a pledge with me, he said. From this day we are brothers, and on the morrow we will set forth. Together they drank the pledge and vowed vows of eternal friendship. Meanwhile, Brunhilde had grown very lonely. Although she had urged Siegfried to go out into the world and win greater fame, her heart still cried for him, and she wondered, as the days crept by, when he would return. She no longer thought of Valhalla or the war maidens. Her whole thought was of Siegfried the fearless. One day, as she sat and brooded, she heard the long silent cry of the war maidens, Ho yo to ho, and looked up in astonishment to see one of her sisters come flying on her steed through the clouds. The next instant the two maidens were sobbing upon each other's necks in the joy of reunion. How came you to brave Wotan's displeasure? exclaimed Brunhilde. Do you not know that I am cut off from you, and that you incur a great danger in coming thus to me? Wotan no longer cares, answered her sister. Since his spear of authority was broken, he sits in Valhalla with moody brow. And, O oh, my sister, that is why I have come to you. 
I heard him say that if you but gave up the ring to the Rhine maidens of your own accord, the curse would be removed and the home of the gods saved. But I cannot give it up, exclaimed Brunhilde, wildly pressing the ring to her heart. It is my betrothal ring from Siegfried, and I have promised to guard it always. That is the only way Valhalla can be saved. Surely you can do that little thing, her sister entreated. What care I for Valhalla? said Brunhilde stormily. I have so long been denied its halls that I have ceased to care. The love of Siegfried is the dearest thing I have in the world. Wotan cannot take that away from me. Go back and tell him so. Then woe must come upon us all, cried her sister, and seeing further entreaty was useless, she sprang hastily upon her steed and rode away. Brunhilde made no effort to stay her, but fell again into brooding silence. Presently, however, she heard the sound of a horn and sprang eagerly to her feet. It was Siegfried's horn, and he was returning. She rushed to the edge of the rock. The flames, which had been burning fiercely, parted to right and left, as once before, and the form of a man appeared. It was indeed Siegfried, but she did not recognize him. He had put the magic helmet upon his head and taken the form of Gunther. With Gunther's voice he also spoke to her. In a tremble she asked, Who has dared come where only the fearless hero finds a way? I am Gunther the king, he answered, and have come to claim you as my bride. That cannot be, she answered, I am Siegfried's promised wife. Siegfried, you are mad, he is promised to another. Come with me. Away, it is not true, she cried. This is his ring, and in its name I tell you to be gone. She waved it threateningly, but he stepped forward. If that is his ring, I must take it, he said, and before she could avoid him he seized her hand and removed the golden hoop from her finger. Come with me, he commanded, in the name of this bauble I tell you to obey. He had said the words in imitation of her manner, and not at all expecting her to yield so easily, for the power of the ring also had gone from his memory. But what was his amazement to see her come forward meekly and prepare to go with him? Only as she left the rock she turned her eyes toward the sky and moaned, Ah, Wotan, I see thy hand in this. Forgive me for having defied thee. Siegfried could make nothing of this outcry, but delighted that he should succeed in his wooing for Gunther so easily, he led her down the mountainside and bade her rest a moment by a fountain. She did so when he went swiftly around a rock and disappeared. The real Gunther, who had awaited him there, now came forward in his stead with horses and bade Brunhilde mount. She sadly obeyed and rode with him toward his castle, while Siegfried dashed swiftly ahead to greet Gudrum and await their coming. Hagen, meanwhile, had not been idle at the palace. He had seen Albrecht, and they had plotted together as to the best means to seize the ring, no matter who should return wearing it. Hagen had also talked with Gudrun and easily persuaded her to accept Siegfried without delay upon his return. Siegfried, therefore, found a pleasing welcome when he presently arrived, and he had exchanged vows with the princess before the horns announced that the king was returning with his bride. Siegfried and Gudrun with Hagen met the royal party at the landing. "'Welcome home, brother,' said Siegfried. "'I am overjoyed to see that you have been as successful in your suit as I have been in mine.' Gudrun also kissed her brother. Brunhilde, however, at sight of Siegfried, started back. "'Siegfried! You here? Is it true, then, that you are plighted to another?' "'I am plighted to Gudrun,' he answered calmly. Brunhilde felt a deathly faintness come over her, and came near falling to the ground. Siegfried sprang forward and supported her. "'Ah, Siegfried, beloved, do you not remember me?' she asked faintly. The voice stirred strange chords within him, but he did not understand them. He quietly seated her, then turning, said, "'Gunther, your bride is ill,' and as the king approached, he added to her, "'You have been faint. See, here comes your husband.' 
As he pointed to the king, Brunhilde saw the fatal ring gleaming upon Siegfried's finger. "'Ah, the ring!' she cried. "'Siegfried's ring! My ring! Where got you it, if you are not my hero himself?' "'She is excited and overcome by her journey,' said Siegfried to the others. Then, as if talking to himself, he went on, "'This ring? Where did I get it, I wonder? It seems to me that sometime, somewhere—' I forget just where. I fought a dragon and wrested the ring from him. Siegfried knitted his brow and strove to recall the past. Hagen stepped quickly forward. This excitement is proving too much for both our brides and bridegrooms, he said gaily. Come, let us within, where a feast is spread in honor of the great day. The king was swift to see his suggestion. "'Yes, order the trumpets to blow,' he ordered. "'We will rest from our journey and have public feastings.' The party entered the castle, Brunhilde with the rest. She had looked once again beseechingly at Siegfried, but all his attention was bestowed upon Gudrun. At last the proud spirit of Brunhilde flashed up at what she deemed an insult. She, a daughter of the gods, to be wooed and then forsaken." she vowed revenge upon siegfried for his rudeness however she gave no sign of all this she joined the feast and sat smilingly at gunther's side she became his wife while still her heart cried out for her hero and cried in no less measure for revenge hagen alone knew of the struggle that was going on in brunhilde's mind he watched anxiously her every action and now that he saw her smile and accept King Gunther before them all, he rubbed his hands in glee under the banquet board. He saw that his evil schemes were succeeding just as he had planned. And so, after the feast was ended, while all was laughter and music within the hall, Hagen came up and talked to Brunhilde. At first it was only idle talk and hidden flattery. Then he touched upon Siegfried. "'Speak not to me of him,' said Brunhilde coldly. "'Why not?' asked Hagen, in feigned surprise. "'He is said to be the bravest hero in the world.' "'He may be brave, but I care not to talk of him. "'He is the falsest man alive.' "'Some rash impulse made her say these words, "'and she regretted them as soon as spoken. "'But Hagen was quick to follow them up. "'You amaze and alarm me,' he said. "'I had supposed him to be honourable. "'If he is false, he is a menace to our kingdom, "'and I for one would wish that he were out of it.' "'It would indeed be better if he were gone,' said Brunhilde, "'her pride still making her utter rash things. "'I am glad you have advised me of his true character,' said Hagen craftily. "'The king purposes to give a hunting party to-morrow. "'Now if Siegfried should not return from it, do you think it would be better so? Yes, said Brunhilde indifferently, and turned to speak to the king. But if she gave no more thought to these fateful words, Hagen fairly hugged them to his heart. He saw in them a license to do evil to Siegfried. The next day, as he had said, the king gave a hunting party in honor of the two brides. All were to meet at noonday for a repast in a grove, but were at liberty to follow that morning wherever the chase might lead. Siegfried's horse Grani soon outdistanced all the others and led him into a deep wood. There he started a bear, but after pursuing it for some time it disappeared, and Siegfried found himself upon a wild part of the banks of the Rhine. Being thirsty and weary, he dismounted, drank at the river's brink, and threw himself down upon a mossy knoll. Just then he heard the sound of singing, a melodious but unearthly strain ending almost in a wail. Looking around, he saw three river nymphs rise out of the water and swim toward him. They were the Rhine maidens, but Siegfried had never seen them before. However, he was undaunted at the vision and sought to make a jest at their expense. "'Hail, fair maidens!' he exclaimed. Some elf has led me astray, so I desire your aid. This elf was in the shape of a bear, and if he was not a friend of yours, I wish you would help me to find him. What will you give us if we help you? they asked. I have nothing to give until I catch him, replied Siegfried, laughing. What do you desire? 
One of the maidens swam to him with outstretched hand. A golden ring enwraps your finger, she said. Give us the ring and we will help you find the bear. I think I slew a huge dragon to win this ring, replied Siegfried lightly. That would be a sorry trade for me to barter it for a bear. You are selfish, the maiden sang teasingly. Be wise and give us the ring. They dived in and out of the water, and Siegfried laughed to watch them, secretly resolving to throw them the ring before he left them, for it had no present value in his eyes. But soon the three maidens swam close to the shore and lifted up their arms warningly. "'Beware, Siegfried!' they exclaimed. "'The ring has a curse upon it. Better give it to us.' "'A curse?' he asked. "'That makes it interesting. I must hear about this curse.' Then the Rhine maiden sang, Siegfried, 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 sorrow dire we foresee. If thou wardest the ring, a curse it will be. From the gold of the Rhine it was craftily wrought, then cursed by the dwarf when its magic he sought. Whoever shall own it is fated to fall. The dragon thou slewest was but one among all. Today thou art stricken, thy doom we divine, unless thou returnest the ring to the Rhine. Siegfried heard the song through, then placed the ring tightly on his finger. Ah, ye are trying to frighten me into giving up the trinket, he said, but ye have sung your song to the wrong ears. I know not what fear is, and have been hunting it all my life. Beware, Siegfried, the maidens cried entreatingly, sinking once more into the water's depths. Farewell, he called after them laughingly. I must hasten to join the hunt. The sound of a faraway horn was now heard, and he answered it with his bugle, then hastily mounted Grani and rode away. Thanks to his swift steed, he soon reached the spot agreed upon for the noontide repast. He greeted the two ladies, the king, Hagen, and the retainers, and seated himself between Hagen and Gudrun. Brunhilde sat directly opposite, by the king's side. As Siegfried had brought no game to the feast, it was jestingly decreed that he should entertain the company by telling some of his past adventures. Hagen passed goblets of wine to each one present, and took the opportunity to pour into Siegfried's cup a few drops of a potion which caused him to remember again some of his past. So Siegfried began to tell of his early life in the forest with Mime, of how he had harnessed the bear to frighten the dwarf, of his sword of need and the fight with the dragon. The company applauded his story and begged him to go on. He gladly did so, for it now seemed new and strange to him also, or as if it had been a dream. Hagen poured more of the potion into his goblet. After I slew the dragon, continued Siegfried, a strange thing happened. I chanced to get a drop of its blood upon my tongue when I heard a bird singing to me, and I understood all it said. It told me of this magic ring I have on my finger, and of the Rhine gold in a cave. It also told me of a maiden on a mountain height, surrounded by a barrier of fire. Her name was Brunhilde. He sprang to his feet, rubbed his eyes, and looked across the table. Her name was Brunhilde, he exclaimed again, and then he stretched out his arms. Brunhilde, it was you, oh, my beloved, where have you been so long? Brunhilde rose hastily, as if to reply, but before she could utter a word, Siegfried fell backward. Hagen had struck him treacherously from behind with his spear. "'What have you done?' shouted the king, while Gudrun leaned her head swooningly upon her knees. "'I have slain a traitor,' boldly replied Hagen. "'Did you not hear him admit that he had sought Brunhilde before he was wed with the princess Gudrun, and Brunhilde herself ordered his death?' "'No, no!' shrieked Brunhilde, rushing to her dying hero's side. "'Ah, beloved, I see it all now. The curse of the ring was upon us, and you knew not what you did.' She lifted his head upon her lap and tried to pour wine down his throat. His eyes, which were already fast glazing, opened again at the touch of her hand. "'Brunhilde,' he whispered, "'where have you been? I have sought you.' Siegfried, Siegfried, forgive me. It has all been a cruel mistake. Do not die. 
Ah, beloved, look at me with your dear eyes again. Your kiss awakened me from a slumber of years. See, I kiss you and love you. Why do you not awaken as I did? Do not go away and leave me again. I shall not let you go. She pressed her lips wildly upon his, and the kiss stayed his soul yet a moment more. Brunhilde, mother, we will not part. The hero who knew no fear had ended his brief earth battle. Brunhilde wept bitterly at the first outburst of grief, then summoning all her pride and resolution, she rose and confronted Hagen. This is your evil deed, she said. You shall not fasten thoughtless words of mine upon it. There has been conspiracy here, and I fear that ye are all in it. There has indeed been conspiracy, the king answered sadly, but Hagen alone is the doer of this deed, and for it he shall answer. Our conspiracy lay only in giving Siegfried a drink of forgetfulness. We did not know he had become plighted to you, and he himself was made to forget it by the potion. He served us in all innocence. Brunhilde looked at Hagen, Gunther, and Gudrun scornfully, then turned to the retainers. Take up the body of Siegfried, she commanded, and bear it to the river's brink. There we will burn it upon a funeral pyre, and there will I consign this ring of the curse back to the Rhine maidens. They placed Siegfried upon his shield and laid the sword of need across his breast. Then they bore him, as she had commanded, to the bank of the river. At sunset a great funeral pyre had been erected, and the body was laid upon it. A torch was applied, and as the heap burst into flame, Brunhilde called her steed Grani and mounted him. Ho yo to ho! she cried, giving for the last time the call of the war maidens. Siegfried, beloved, I come to thee! And straight into the fire she rode, and the flames leaping high hid her and her steed from view. But out of the midst of the pyre her voice called to the Rhine maidens, Behold the ring, the ring of the curse. Come, seize it, and may gods and men be relieved of its ban. At her cry a wondrous thing was seen by the watchers round about the pyre. A great wave rose out of the bed of the river, and on its crest the three Rhine maidens appeared. Up over the bank rushed the wave, quenching the fire as it came, and sweeping all before it into the water's depths. Suddenly Hagen gave a fearful cry. He beheld the ring again being swept from beyond his grasp, and he plunged into the current and attempted to take it from one of the maidens, who held it exultingly aloft. But the other two twined their arms about him and dragged him down with them. When the wave had subsided, he was no longer to be seen, nor was there any vestige of the funeral pyre or Brunhilde. The curse of the ring was wiped away. Just then a reddish glow was seen in the sky. Swiftly it grew and spread like the light of many auroras. In speechless amazement the onlookers beheld this awe-inspiring sight. The doom of the gods had come with the recovery of the ring, Valhalla was being destroyed. Botan's kingdom was at an end. Henceforth the world was to press forward to new and better things. End of story four.